So you put it in the best spot you can, and then you attempt to calibrate it using the autopilot. When the autopilot calibrates it, it will report back to you and tell you, no, that's a good spot or a bad spot. It either passed calibration or it didn't. And if you've, got, if you've put the compass in a bad spot, then it won't be able to calibrate. But when you, when you calibrate the compass, you go out there and you drive around in circles. And basically what's happening is the autopilot is design, dividing that circle up into 360 increments of time. So if your, ter if your circle takes 360 seconds to complete, it says, OK, one second per degree. So each second of time it assigns is one degree. So as you're going along in your stereo speaker, as you, as you swing past this point, that it, it causes the thing to vary in one second by five degrees. The autopilot computer makes up a little table and says, OK, when you're going southeast, subtract five degrees. When you're going northwest, add two degrees. And it makes what's called a deviation card. If ever, maybe everyone knows what a deviation card is. It will make an electronic deviation card and apply it constantly to the autopilot's computer. So as a result of that, typically after calibration, the autopilot's computer is more accurate than the magnetic on the, on the dash, unless you've had the magnetic compensated. You know. But the fact that you're able to calibrate it automatically means accurate compass, which is a good thing. Um, as, now, autopilots do. Um, they're affected just like people are by the seas, the wind, and the current. And uh, so what I said about auto mode, it's just like when I went across the lake for the first time in my roamer, I pointed the boat east, and I said, hold east. And I held east all the way across. I didn't have an autopilot, but I was the autopilot. Um, and uh, it, when I got there, I was five miles off. Well, I, I know I aimed it right at Saugatuck when I left. but. And I know I held it east the whole time. So how could I be five miles off? Well, I was blown by the wind, constantly keeping it east. I was blown by the wind five miles south. So when you, when you do electronic navigation, you enter from your current position to Saugatuck, and it draws a line from your current position to Saugatuck. You can, if you drive straight down that line, it's going to burn the minimum amount of gas, in theory. Um, and so in order to stay on that line, Autopilots have what's called navigate mode. Auto, auto mode I call point and shoot mode. That's the way I went across the lake in my roamer. In navigate mode, it actually listens to the, the GPS chart plotter and keeps you on that line. So that's, that's called navigate mode. And uh, that's obviously the most desirable mode to run in. If you have it all hooked up, that's the best thing to do. So um, the you can also steer wind angle. Any crazy sailboaters in this room? Not you. <laughs> yeah. You know, keeping the wind angle the same means your boat will, stale, will sail the same. You know, you set your sails and everything up to, to, for this wind angle. And as long as you can maintain that wind angle, you're going to maintain your hull speed, right? <laughs> kind of in theory. <laughs> um, so um, steering wind angle is, is what's, what a lot of sailboaters want to do. And just be aware that if the wind changes, your course changes. That's, you know, you never know where you're going to end up, but at least you'll go fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some really advanced autopilot functions, which I will skim over. One of them is there's an autopilot out now that actually controls the bow thruster. <laughs> So as you're going along, some, some people, when they're fishing, they literally don't want to even do this. So this autopilot can actually keep the bow, I mean, dead, dead straight using the bow thruster. But uh, that's not something you'll probably end up with on your boat. Flip the slide. Fish finders is a fairly difficult subject. Believe it or not, it's, they're as complicated or more complicated than a radar. Um, it's doing basically the same thing. It's pinging out a, 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 a packet of energy and looking for reflections back. And uh, so I guess in that respect, it's the same as, as, as uh, radar. The thing is, you're trying to see so much more with a fish finder. You want to know, is it a school of fish or is it one fish? You know, is it, is it bait fish? Is it a coho? Is it a king? I mean, there, and there's guys that get so good at watching the fish finder that they can literally tell the difference between a coho and a king on the fish finder. So um, when it comes to fish finder performance, it's really all about the transducer. Yes, there are fancy features of fish finders that people like, color display, monochrome display. There's all kinds of features. And you know, bigger, again, is better with displays always. But uh, it's really the transducer is what determines how well your fish finder is going to work. The, the 
analogy I can give you is the $100 stereo with $1,000 speakers sounds pretty good. $1,000 stereo with $100 speakers sounds cheap. You know, so that's the analogy I can give you. That's also true in VHF antenna and VHF radios, by the way. You know, cheap VHF with a really great antenna is gonna work great. Great VHF, crappy antenna, crappy results, you know, bottom line. So same thing with transducers. You put a little dinky cheap transducer to the thing, it's gonna be dinky and cheap. So uh, when it comes to transducers, once again, size matters. The bigger ones have a narrower beam, they can do, well, bigger ones have a better ability to receive weak signals back. That's really what it comes down to, is size has a better ability to receive. Now, as far as beam width goes, um, you need to keep beam width in mind. I don't know how many, I'm sure there's some fishermen in this room. Um, when you're fishing in like 50 feet of water and you're, and you're running a transducer, say, with a six degree beam, you're only marking about a 10 foot circle on the bottom because the beam is so narrow, you're just, you're marking a small space. So we all fish in what they call shallow water around here. Uh, 500 feet and over is deep water. So we don't find a lot of 500 foot plus water in Lake Michigan or anywhere around here. There's some, but for the most part, we fish in like 100 feet of water, 50 feet of water. So having a, bro a wide beam width casts a much bigger net looking for, to mark fish. So the, the, the beam angle is very important for, uh, for actual being able to mark fish. Um, frequency, you know, there's a lot of discussion about frequency, the 50 versus 200 kilohertz, and when you go shopping for a fish finder, they'll tell you, oh, it's dual frequency. And uh, the frequencies, the lower the frequency, the better it penetrates. So if you want to mark 2,000 feet of water, you really need 50 kilohertz. You, you know, 200 kilohertz just won't get there. But uh, the 200 kilohertz has better resolution. It doesn't penetrate as well, but it gives you more dots per inch, if you will. Just like the radar analogy, if you see a, a bump on the bottom and you, you're wondering, is that, a, is that, what is that? The 50 kilohertz is gonna just return the bump. The 200 kilohertz might return the bump and the mass, and then now you know it's a sunken vessel, you know. So uh, the 200 is higher res, 50 is better penetration. Um, the, Fairing blocks is something that you guys will run into, if, especially if you do your own installation, or you'll see them on your boats. The, the through-hull transducer, you know, the hull has a dead rise associated with it, so if you put a transducer in there, it's shooting off that away. So in order to make it shoot straight down, so that when so you're marking fish straight under your boat, you use what's called a fairing block. And basically, the fairing block is just a block, and you cut it at the angle of the hull, you put half inside, half outside, and it causes the transducer to sit straight. There's a bunch of ways to ferret all the way from just making a fiberglass fairing for the thing, just making the hull straight at that point. But it is fairly important to use a fairing block because if you don't, you will introduce a percent error. So if you're off, say, these aren't real numbers, but say you're off 10 degrees and uh, that will introduce a 10% error, which doesn't matter. The difference between 10 and 11 feet doesn't matter. But the difference between 100 and 110 starts to matter, so it depends on your depth. A percent error can, can matter. And fishermen, obviously, they want to mark the fish below their boat, not the fish over there. So when it comes to shallow water protect detection, it's really not that important. 